بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. Last week we spoke about the first three verses of Surah Al-Fatiha, and these three verses are dedicated to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, as I will inshallah explain once we get to that that part. And from these three verses, if we were to analyze them and try and pinpoint the one emotion that each verse is trying to address, trying to arouse, then the first verse, Bismillah, um, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, is the emotion of love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is telling us that He is someone who we love. And he is someone who is lovable and should be loved. And that is the foundation of worship, love. And this is something, unfortunately, those coming from Eastern cultures, or even my generation, did not grow up hearing. And when someone comes and starts saying oh, it's about love and loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're like, what are you talking about? You, you sound like a Christian, right? Uh, which is very unfortunate. Because when you look at the scholars who spoke about spirituality, especially Ibn Qayyim you find that he constantly points to this, that the, the soul of the relationship between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is built on love. Without love, you cannot be someone who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you worship Allah, there is an aspect of love that is there. There has to be. We're not going to put our heads, heads down on the floor for someone we don't love it's not going to happen right and therefore those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it's by rejecting him completely like atheists or you know accepting the existence of God by saying no we don't need to worship him or believing God worshiping him but worshiping other than him then there is a big problem in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points this out وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ and among people, referring to the pagans and Quraysh, uh, are those who take besides Allah, uh, those who they make equal to Allah, equivalent to Allah. They love them the way they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ However, those who believe, their love for Allah is even greater than their love for Allah and their love for their false deities. Uh, that's one example of how important love is and how critical it is to a person's worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their relationship to Him. Another example is uh, in Surah Ma'idah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyu alladhina amanu man yartadda minkum an deenihi fasawfa ya'ti Allahu biqawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. O you who believe, whoever uh, apostates from their faith, whoever turns back from their faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace them. And then He gives a list of qualities that these people will have who Allah replaces them with. Number one, they love Allah and Allah loves them. Right there. And Surat Baqarah, Allah huwa liyu ladhina amanu yukhrijuhum minal dhulumati ila nur. Allah is the friend, the wali. And part of wilaya is love. There is that meaning of love in there. Allah loves those who believe in Him as they love Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what it's grounded in. Now how do we build our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well one crucial way, one critical way, is noticing and, and exploring what makes him praiseworthy. Because someone who does what he does, gives us what he gives us, created for us what he created, we have to love that. And again, going back to the analogy between child and parent, that relationship, you know, when a child sits down, or at least when they have a child, and they see what their wife goes through, what they go through, you know, the amount of love they give for their children, they start thinking about, oh my God, my parents did this for me too. Right? And that's why Allah points it out in the Quran. You know, when that child becomes at the age of 40, now he has kids, he realizes, man, I gotta I got be more responsible with my parents. Because they see, they start realizing my parents did that for me and that love increases. So we need to look at what Allah does for us. You know, if the parents deserve so much respect and so much honor and so much obedience because, you know, the mother, you know, bore that child, held that child for nine months in the stomach and all the, the, the troubles that come with that and the labor pains and you know, breastfeed, nurse that child, 
you know, changed his diapers or her diapers, etc., etc., fed them, and you know, it's not exactly fun. <laughs> I'm going through this right now. It's not exactly fun. Yet, despite all the troubles, that that immense amount of love is still there, and it doesn't decrease. It only increases, right? If the parents deserve that respect and obedience and love because they did that for us, well, what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created us? He gave us life. He gave us a soul. He gave us a body. He gave us, you know, our senses. I mean, what can replace that? Etc., etc. So Allah is definitely much more worthy of obedience and love and respect and honor and duty. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what we get from the first verse. It's telling us that that relationship, because why is Allah t telling us this? Why is He describing Himself in the Quran? Is this because He's boasting? No, He's saying, this is how you relate to me. Right? First, there's that concept of love. You relate to me through love. And that needs to be built. So it just doesn't come out of nowhere, it needs to be built. Uh, and then second, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And this is very important, especially for our times and the major amounts, or you know, the, the excessive mental illness, uh, mental illnesses that are just rampant in the Western world. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. That is playing on the emotion of hope. Because mercy, well, I mean, when you think about it, what is Allah's mercy? What is it, what is it telling us? That there's always a way. There's always something better. Any situation can be changed for better. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الدُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Oh my servants, uh, those who transgressed all boundaries, all limits. I mean, they did everything left and right. There's nothing that they could have done except that they did it. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, He is the all-forgiving and the all-compassionate. Um, and this is quite amazing. You know, hope, hopelessness, depression is, is a risk, risk factor of suicide. People feel a sense of hopelessness. It's just no, nothing is going to change. There's no reason to live. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly addresses that and says, no, there's always a reason to live. There's always something to gain. There's always something to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of changing any person's situation hope that when we look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless of our situation we know that we have someone to look to who can solve all of our problems no matter how complex no matter how uh, hopeless it may seem you know especially parents who are dealing with kids and disobedient kids I mean, as imams we, we always get these emails and one of the things to remind them uh, is that they're never a hopeless cause to never look at their child as this is hopeless. We don't believe in that in Islam. In fact, we are forbidden from despairing from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Yaqub wasalam, tells his children, Do not despair from the, you know, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only people who despair from the mercy of Allah are those who disbelieve in Him. And it's very important, and we went over this in the Aqidah book, right? Because when someone is, says, oh, that's it, Allah can't offer me anything, well, that is an act of, that is a word, a belief of blasphemy, right? Uh, so hope, we find hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then finally, Malik Yawmiddin, right? This is a, a verse that's telling each and every one of us, there is a day, we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will be standing right in front of him, a one-on-one -on -one private appointment. And in our hands will be the Book of Deeds. And the Quran describes you know, those moments when we take our book and read it. And we will say, oh my God, there's nothing left out. Absolutely nothing that's left out of this. Well, those who didn't do so well in this life, well, that's going to be a big problem. You can imagine you know, their, their state of mind, their anxiety, their stress, their fear. And that's what this verse is playing on, fear. But the fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, arouses is not a negative fear. 
It's not a fear that's meant to cause a person to, you know, uh, lose control of their, themselves. Rather, it is a type of fear that motivates a person to act. Why? Because it's a fear of what? Responsibility, accountability. This is what we are afraid of, our account. How are we going to be judged on the day of judgment? Well, I better work now. So when that fear comes, what it's supposed to do right, is remind that person, hey, there's still some time. You know, Allah is offering you paradise. He's offering you a kingdom like none other. And He's telling you that there are dire consequences for not taking this seriously. This is what it's meant to do. And know, you know, when you study psychology and emotions in psychology, uh, emotions are a double-edged sword. They're not all positive and they're not all negative. Rather, it could be positive and it could be negative. It depends on how you react to it and how do you use it. Love, which is one of the most desired emotions. We love feeling love. I mean, it's just so beautiful. You know, it could be very harmful if you love the wrong thing. But it could be very beneficial if you love the right thing. So when that love is directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, you're loving something. And right? when you love something, you become attached to it. So when you love Allah, you become attached to something that is the ultimate benefit for you. When you have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're, you're placing your hope, you're becoming attached, dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will never let you down. When you, are, when you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, you are fearing someone who's also the most compassionate. Also the one who's telling you, okay, look, you got to be careful, but you need to do one, two, and three. Again, going back to the example of parents. If you come home late, right, you're going to get grounded. But if something happens, give me a call. That's what it's going. So our emotions are being put on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's where it, it's healthy to put our emotions. If our hope is put into someone who is going to fail us, then that's just double, uh, that's a double whammy, right? If our fear is in someone who, you know, is not worthy of being feared, or fearing them will, will only bring us more stress and harm, right? Then that's a double whammy right there. So you have these three emotions, and these three emotions are the channels through which we engage with Allah subhanahu wa the main ones. Now there are other emotions, right? But these are the three main ones in which our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa is built. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ This is, you know, the middle verse, depending on, you know, what, what um, school of thought you follow. However, structurally, it is the middle, middle verse uh, across the board. Uh, it means, it is you alone who we worship, and it is you alone who we seek help from. And this is really the most important verse in the Qur'an. And this is the verse in which this entire book, you know, this 1200 plus page book uh, revolves around entirely and it is the foundation of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we will get to inshallah uh, so I'm going to skip over this verse but then come back to it uh, but before that um, the scholars said that all of revelation has been summarized in the Quran and the Quran is summarized in Surah Fatiha and Surah Fatiha is summarized in this verse right here right so this is the key verse inshallah we will get back to it uh, momentarily uh, or next week inshallah then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al mustaqim right guide us on the straight path now if a person were to do a project and find all the descriptions the attributes the adjectives the adjectives used to describe Islam right and its various names you will have attained a, an amount of knowledge that's really quite precious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as huda, guidance. Uh, rahma, mercy. Bushra, glad tidings. Here it describes it as sirat, a path, and mustaqim, that is straight. Right? So, let's take a sirat. You know, it's a path. Now, when we say something is a path, right? Just imagine this for now. Even the way we use this word till this day. If a person is crossing a field, 
to reach a home, are they following a path? No, no, just imagine this. It's a field. A field of grass. Are they on a path? Unless there is a path. Right. Yeah. right? Not necessarily, because when we say a path, what we imagine is some sort of, you know, road, some sort of walkway, something that is clearly, you know, a place where people walk. Whereas if you're on a path, now you might mean it metaphorically, right? But linguistically, you, we wouldn't really say that that person's on a path. No, we need some sort of road. It needs to be clear. It needs to have certain attributes. This is a place where humans walk. People walk on. Or else it's not a path. Right? So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As-sirat, it is a path. It tells us that this path has descriptions. It has, it has qualities. It can be defined. And that's very important. This path is defined. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined it for us. The first quality of this path, the first definition of this path is La ilaha illallah. There's nothing worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what it is. And then you have the, the pillars of Islam, the pillars of Iman that further define this path. Because there are other faiths that believe in monotheism. There are other monotheistic faiths, right? But we are not the same as them. We're different. This is a different path. But the main, you know, that foundation for this path, the, the, the asphalt for this path, is La ilaha illallah. That's what it is. And then you put these pillars and that further define this road. And then to even further define it, we have the halal and the haram. When is a person on this path? Is when they are applying this. Right? When a person deviates from it, they have deviated from the path. And in an authentic hadith, it's narrated the Prophet ﷺ took a, a stick and in the sand or in the dirt, he drew a line like this. You know, the companions are gathered around him. They can't wait for the Prophet ﷺ to speak, right? Not like today when you say the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I'm not, I'm not really interested. Or, you know, what, what did he mean and this and that. And we start going into, you know, tangents and logical uh, discussions and, and we, we deviate from the point and the message subhanAllah so he took the stick and he drew a, a path like this a line and then branching out from that line a, a lot of different paths he said this the straight path right here that is Islam and all these other paths are deviations from Islam at each path right so if you can imagine the intersection between the path of Islam and these other uh, paths, at each one is a shaitan, is a devil calling to it. Right? So, I mean, you can just see this today. People calling to all different ideologies, left and right, whether it's on the conservative side or on the liberal side. And even in each, under each one, you have different, you know, strands. You have ultra conservative, you have moderate conservative, you have you know, neo conservative, alt right, and then on the left you have you know atheists, and you have this, and you have that, and you have uh, neoliberals and ultra liberals and you know, moderate liberals, and and each person, and each each strand has people calling to it, and with YouTube and social media, mashallah, you know anyone can put, make them make for themselves a studio, right, and call people to it, and then you know they get hundreds of thousands of views. Especially, especially these conspiracy theorists, right? These, these are, mashallah, the ones who get the most. Um, they are people who speak very well, but they're not people of knowledge. So someone who is not an expert in the field they are talking about, or the subject that they are talking about, well, the way they present it is quite, is quite appealing. And you have all of these people you know, watching. And, and there are some examples in the Eastern world. And one big name, I'm sure you all know, but I'm not going to mention. It's all about, you know, the end of times and look at all this. Is, you know, the Jad is not really a person. It's a system, right? And Yajuj and Majuj have already been released. And all these things are happening and all these conspiracy theories. And man, it is so fun to listen to, right? What is that person talking about? They're not bringing authentic hadith or they're misinterpreting authentic hadith and verses of the Quran, etc., etc. That's very problematic. 
And the Prophet ﷺ warns of this, you know, the scholars, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep taking knowledge away with the death of scholars until people take ignorant people as their leaders. And they will misguide them and they will be misguided. So it's, it's quite dangerous and it's quite uh, crucial that as individuals there is some amount of effort uh, in your lives, individual lives, to learn and to seek knowledge. Because a common question I get, you know, how do we know who's, who's speaking the truth, right? You know, how do, how do we know? Well, part of knowing is you doing the research yourself, right? I mean, I can sit here talking to you day and night, and you might believe me. Or some people might not believe me and say, oh, this sheikh is, you know, he's talking madness. But unless you go and do the research yourself, how are you going to know? Right, how are you going to know? And when you do that, if I'm, what I'm saying is correct, you know, it, it has roots in Islam, you find it in the books, that will increase your trust in me. And if someone doesn't trust me, well, they'll start trusting me. See how that works? So there has to be an, a, an individual effort of, on each and every one of you to do some research. And this is your faith in the end, you know, to protect your own selves. Because the consequences are, are dire. So Islam is a path, it's a sirat. And a path, is it leading somewhere or nowhere? Right? There are some paths that lead nowhere, but who wants to take that path? It's a path, it's leading to something, to someone. And, uh, you know, imagine this, everyone's on a path. Everyone is on a path. Some people know their path, they have a vision. Some people never really thought about it, they have no vision. I mean, I've met people, just, where are you going in your life? I don't know, I never thought of it. Right? I'm not talking about young kids. I'm talking about people in their 30s and 40s. But I don't know, I mean, I didn't really thought, think about it. It's about eating, drinking, you know, working, getting, getting an income, and spending on my family. Right? Well, think a little deeper. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us to do is think about the path after death. Where is the path? You know, the path you are on today, once you pass away, where is that going to lead you? That is the concern of the Qur'an, right? So we are on a path. What we do affects where we go. The path that we choose, right, is based on our actions. Our actions are, wh are what put us on the path, right? Because someone can say, okay, I I'm, gonna, I'm on the straight path. I want to be on the straight path. I'm on it. Okay, I'm just going to go do whatever I want. It's not the way it works. There has to be an effort. Because someone who's on a path is walking it. So you see that part of the, the beauty of describing Sam as a path is that there's an effort being put for that person to actually cross it. You know, that path being our, our life. We're crossing it through with time. But in order to cross it, there's also effort that needs to be put in. Uh, so Islam is a religion that you need to work with and a religion that tells you there's some effort you need to put there's some energy you need to spend on this five daily prayers fasting Ramadan you know giving zakat you have to be a productive member of society right we're not allowed to just sit sit on our you know backs or lay down on our backs and and let other people spend on us and we know what Umar radiallahu anh did to those type of people right you chase them out of the masjid with a stick out of the masjid Right? It's like, go and work. You're not going to be a, a burden on society. That's just not the way it works. Right? And therefore, this path, and we're you know, kind of expanding on this path, this path is something that um, encompasses all of our lives. Everything in our life. You know, from our spiritual life, from our marital life, from our work life, from our personal life, from our social life. Islam has something to say about all of this. And it gives us principles, it gives us guidelines, it gives us tools, you know, guidance. What is guidance? Guidance is, you know, teaching you how to make the right decision. Giving you the tools to understand the world around you. Understand the behavior of people. Right? And sociology, psychology, part of it is understanding the behavior of people. Why they do what they do. And how that affects them on an individual level, you know, in psychology and you know, their, their choices and their behavior, or in sociology, how it, uh, how it affects the society, whether it be the, you know, the city or the country or the nation or the world, etc. Um, so, Islam has something to say about all of these realms. 
uh, and it gives us the insight to make better choices, to make better decisions, etc. Um, and another quality of this path is that sirat is singular. It's not plural. Right? And this is quite discomforting for a lot of people today, a lot of Muslims. But, you know, we need to be fair and just. As people today are saying, you know, Islam speaks truth. Islam is about justice. Speaking truth to power, right? Well, what's, what greater truth is, the, is there than la ilaha illallah? And I mean, this is quite serious. It's uncomfortable, especially since we have a lot of friends, a lot of amazing people who do great work, you know, who, who are spiritual in their own realms. Uh, but we would be doing them an, uh, a disservice if we say that, oh no, you're okay, and that's it. Uh, Islam, we believe, is a truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite clear about that. Especially in the first uh, few chapters of the Quran. Surah Baqarah, Surah uh, Ali Imran, Nisa, and Al Ma'idah. Uh, directly addresses uh, you know, our fellow Abrahamic faiths, uh, Judaism and Christianity. And whoever disbelieves in the verses of the Quran, then they have disbelieved. Whoever disbelieves in the Prophet them, has disbelieved. Right? And the Prophet said when he would engage with the Jews and Christians, it was a theological engagement. Right? Say, oh people of the book, let us, let us come to common terms. That we worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't associate partners with Him. And we don't take each other as lords besides Allah. As deities besides Allah. Right? And when you analyze the Qur'an and you see how the Qur'an engages Jews and Christians specifically, it's actually more dialogue, uh, building bridges. That's what it is. وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِي أَحْسَنُ Do not dialogue with you know, the people of the book except in the best way, in an excellent manner. So when it comes to working with Jews and Christians, it's, the Qur'an is quite clear, uh, in my opinion, that it's about building bridges and discussing our theological differences. Uh, and you see that in our classical tradition. The classical scholars all throughout Islamic history, especially in major cities like uh, Baghdad and Dam Damascus and, and Cairo, uh, there are many incidents where scholars in their books write about the, the theological circles that they have, and you have Jews and Christians on, on that you know part of that discussion. Ibn Qayyim talks about his debates with fellow Christians, right, uh, and so on and so forth. But we need to be honest with ourselves. The Quran is quite clear that Islam is the only path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and therefore we must, we must be cognizant about that so that we don't do an injustice to others when they ask us you know what does Islam say about you know who goes to paradise in Islam right? we say the following uh, after the Prophet sallallahu and after the Quran was revealed that the only path to, to paradise is the path of Islam right as for pre-Islam then you know, those who are, mo who are on monotheism, whether Jew or Christian, then they are people of paradise. Um, uh, as for post, as I said, it's, it's Islam. Um, okay, what about if they didn't know about Islam? In our times, not a lot of people. A lot of people don't know what Islam really is. Or their understanding of Islam is, you know, Fox News' description of Islam. Quite problematic, right? That could be an excuse for them, because the Quran does say, we don't punish anyone uh, before sending a messenger right? and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold someone accountable spiritually until uh, the message has reached them now does that mean every single person who's not a Muslim right, post Islam is destined or doomed for hellfire not necessarily not necessarily there could be individuals which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives, forgives, right? Potentially. The Qur'an does not, as far as I know, does not deny that. So Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, you know, when he is in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah asks him, and this is in the end of Surah Ma'idah, uh, the fifth chapter, when Allah asks him, did you tell people to take you as a Lord besides me? He said no. And in the end of his monologue, he says, in tu'adhibhum fa'innahum ibaduk, wa in tawfir lahum fa'innaka antal azizul hakim. If you... Uh, punish them, then they are your servants. You have the right to do that. But if you forgive them, then you are the Almighty and the All Wise. Allah doesn't deny that. He doesn't say, No, I will never forgive them. Right? Uh, but 
the Quran does say the path to him, to Allah, the path to paradise is Islam. Uh, and Allah does not accept anything besides that. So it is one path. Now, when we go into the intra-religious circle within ourselves, right? You have many different strands of Islam. I mean, you have the Salafis, you have the Sufis, you have the Ikhwanis, right? The Brotherhood, and you have all these different kinds. Who's on the straight path? Uh, Imam Shatibi uh, wrote an entire book discussing this. Right, a pretty long book, almost 600 pages. Who is on the straight path? Who, how do we know that? Uh, well, the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith, in a reliable hadith, um, which has a lot of variations, not all of which are authentic, but the fact that there were so many variations of the hadith kind of strengthens its uh, authenticity or reliability. He says that, uh, the Jews split into 71 strands or sects the Christians 72 and the Muslims 73 strands right uh, all of them meaning referring to the strands of Islam are in the hellfire except one uh oh right. uh, they asked him you know you can be if you're concerned the companions were concerned they asked him well who's that and then you have, here's where the variations come in the hadith. One of the most reliable is that what I and my companions are on. You know, the way we understand Islam, that is the straight path. Okay, now this, we can go into a long, you know, two-hour discussion about this hadith, but let's get the main point out of it. Um, the strands that are being referred to are heterodoxies, meaning they have gone, they have deviated from a fundamental principle of Islam. But they are still within the fold of Islam. Okay? So, they are on a heterodoxy, but they are still within Islam. Strands who claim to be following Islam, but are clearly outside the fold of Islam, such as those who claim that there's a Prophet after the Prophet uh, such as those who, um, you know, deny certain verses of the Qur'an, these, these are outside the fold of Islam. And they're not even regarded in this hadith. Uh, now you have other strands that are within the fold, but they have, you know, they, they, they are following a major bid'ah, a major innovation. Um, for example, you know, the Mu'tazilites. The Mu'tazilites denied the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that is a major deviation. Why? Because there are literally a thousand verses that reference or talk about Allah and describe Him and etc. Right? So, we know that these strands are referring to those type of people. I mean, these people have, have committed a, or deviated from a major principle in Islam. Now, the hadith threatens punishment. But there's also a principle among the theologians uh, who, that say that Allah doesn't necessarily have to execute his threat. Meaning someone could be a, a thief, right? And there is a, a after, afterlife punishment for theft. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't necessarily have to execute that on every single person. For some people he might excuse it because they did other good deeds. So Allah forgives it. Or because they went through certain uh, hardships in this life and that expiated that sin. Whereas for other people, he will execute it in, uh, in their right because there wasn't anything of that like to expiate that sin. Right? So, you will have people who are under or follow these strands but will not be punished. Whereas others will be punished. So you can see it's, it's very complex. It's not simple where we start labeling people black and white and you are a person of hellfire, you are a person of innovation. It's not the way it works. That's why, you know, this hadith is for scholars to discuss, not anyone else. Now, going back to the, his description of the straight path, what I am on, and my people, or my companions, I'm sorry. Well, what were they on? I mean, this is the entire debate. Because the Mu'tazilites, and the Jabris, and the Qadaris, and all these strands of Islam, uh, they claim to be following what the Prophet ﷺ said, and the companions. Now they'll, they'll take verses from the Quran and Hadith from the Prophet ﷺ and examples from uh, the companions, the saying of the companions, right? And this is why, this is where you can see uh, why it can be quite difficult 
to find someone who's on the straight path, at least for those who don't have uh, a good amount of knowledge in Islam. Uh, so what does Ash-Shatibi say? How does he resolve this? He says, look, in order to be on the path of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, right, we need to know what they were on. There needs to be a level of knowledge of what they say. In order to be on the truth, you must know the truth. And therefore, who are the people who know the truth? The scholars. They are the scholars. And I have spoken quite a bit about scholars and their importance in Islam. And why it's important to know who the scholars are and to follow scholars for those who aren't scholars themselves. right? Because they know the truth, they have studied it. Okay, and again, they don't necessarily have to be on the truth in every single nuanced issue. Right? They could be on the truth. Uh, they'll be on the truth in general. Right? The majority of issues. Uh, in that they, w they call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They revere the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They love the companions. Right? They revere the Quran and sunnah. This is, the, this is their text. This is where they go back to. Um, logic is just a tool to understanding. Uh, Quran and Sunnah, it's not the method uh, or the channel in which they try and fit the Quran and Sunnah. Right? That's a major difference, there's a big difference right there. Those who know the truth are the scholars. But if you remember, I mentioned that scholars, what makes a person a scholar isn't just their knowledge, it's also their, their piety, right? It's also their piety. Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, Ahmad, Bukhari, Muslim, right? Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam al-Ghazali, Ibn Qayyim all these people didn't reach their status just because of their knowledge but also because they were people who are known to be pious and if they are pious to us they are trustworthy I can trust this person that they are not going to you know sell me out or they're not going to sell out or they're not going to withhold truths they're not going to lie to me. That's why it's so important that the person you are listening to is seen as a pious person. Okay? So this is the path. It's a path. And Sirat al-Mustaqim. The second attribute is that this path is Mustaqim. It's straight. And what is the rule? You know, what is the closest distance between two paths? A straight line. Right? So Allah subhanahu is hearing is telling us that this Quran this religion which this Quran puts you on which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called to is the quickest and easiest path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala anything besides it anything that contradicts it anything that is different than it will not take you to Allah in the most effective manner that's the reality and that's why you see these great names who I just mentioned, their emphasis on Quran and Sunnah. Follow the Quran as Allah revealed it. Don't start trying to play with the words, play with the meanings. You know, oh, in the Western you know, mindset, this context or this society, liberal society, and all these freedoms, you know, it is inappropriate for, um, for example, uh, you know, why can't a woman wear, I always mention this example, why can't a woman wear, a, marry, a Muslim woman marry a non-Muslim man? Where's the freedom? Right? Where's the equality? It's not the way it works. The Quran is quite clear in this regard. And twisting and turning it will only cause a person to stray that much off of the straight path. It's no longer straight. Uh, and the examples are many. But this path, if you want to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you want to have a relationship to him with him right this is the path to do it it's right here this is the path anything besides it is only a devi deviation from it it will not take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best and the most effective manner so when Ibn Qayyim talks about you know throughout this book about this straight path right um, this path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well he's focusing well how do we better understand this path what is the quickest way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically 
you know, addressing our emotions and our uh, heart and our spiritual well-being. Um, if you want a path or you want a, a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is going to be through the Quran and through the Sunnah. Anything besides that is an extra burden on you. Take for example, you know, certain strands of Sufism, and not all strands of Sufism uh, are bad. Certain strands of Sufism, you know, obligate the person to do things that the Quran didn't command, nor the Hadith. For example, traveling in the land without any provisions on your back. Literally, it's like, okay, are you ready? Ready for what? We're gonna, we're gonna travel the land. Get up and let's go. Let me pack my bags. No. By packing your bags, it means you're not depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way you should depend. No, it's not the way it works. People have died, you know. <laughs> People, and, and Ibn Jawzi talks about this quite a bit in his book, Sayyid al-Khatir. Right? People have, have suffered permanent damage because of, you know, going, traveling without provisions. And that co contradicts the verse of, uh, in the Surah Al-Baqarah, وَتَزَوَّدُوا And take your provisions in the context of Hajj. Tazawudu, take your provisions when you go to Hajj. And what greater, you know, this amazing act of worship, Allah is telling you, take your provisions. And He also tells us, مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Those who are capable of going to Hajj, you know, it's obligatory upon them. Therefore, if you're physically unable to, or if you're finan financially unable to go to Hajj, then it's not an obligation on you. And part of that financial capability is making sure you leave behind for your family what they can use to survive while you're gone. Right? So that completely contradicts the Quran. Also, just secluding yourself from society and wandering the, the lands. You know, nature is quite important, and observing nature is important to, to, to learning who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. However, living a life of seclusion is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, you know, criticized certain strands of, of uh, Judaism and, and Christianity. And the end of Surah um, Al Hadid, Warahbaniya, Ibtadawha, this this seclusion, this monk, this concept of being a monk uh, in the caves and secluded from society, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they innovated that. It's not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed upon them. Maktabna alayhim. Maktabnaha alayhim, right? He did not prescribe that for them. So uh, these other paths, if they're not in, in line with the Quran and Sunnah, then they will not reap the fruits of spirituality. They will not build a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way the straight path will. It is the quickest path to Allah, it is the easiest path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything besides that is an extra, is extra burden and will not give you spirituality. You might feel a certain sense of you know, spirituality, a spiritual high, but it dissipates, it goes away, it resides. It won't stay with you. Not like praying five times a day. Not like fasting Ramadan or fasting outside of Ramadan. Not like giving charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how to build our spirituality and the most spiritual people were the prophets and the companion, companions of the Prophet And that's why a lot of these you know, top scholars, they heavily emphasize following the early generations. As Salaf al-Salih as they're called. You know, the pious predecessors. The, early, the first 300 years of Islam. Follow them. Why? Because they are most knowledgeable of Islam. And they lived in a time where innovation was very little. After that, and especially in our times, innovations are left and right. And sometimes it gets to the point where uh, an innovated, an innovated um, spiritual or spiritual concept is seen as the truth. And it becomes a custom of the land. And when you try telling people, hey, that's not, that's against the sunnah, right? Like, what are you talking about? And they get really mad. It's like you're challenging their society. You're challenging customs and uh, their, their customs and their uh, traditions. And Ashatabi mentions that in the beginning of his book. He says certain innovations, and he's not talking about major innovations, by the way. Let me, let me just put that there. But minor innovations, but they're still innovations. They are not building spirituality as it could be built. You know, he says that I sat with myself and I pondered, should I address these issues? 
because most of the imams, most of the you know, scholars are not addressing these issues. So that I was pondering, should I address these issues? And it was, you know, a little bit uh, scary to him because he knew what the reaction was going to be. So he said, you know, I said, you know what, I have to. I will not be asked about this on the Day of Judgment. Meaning, I'm, I won't let myself be reprimanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment for not addressing these issues. So he said, I gave a khutbah. And he said, as we say, all hell broke loose. The people got so mad at him, right? But Imam al-Shaqibi is someone who we now revere. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards these uh, scholars who stood up for the truth. Um, and here again, you, you, the emphasis on knowledge. Our spirituality is based on knowledge, as we will get to in the, you know, the concluding verses of Surah Fatiha. Uh, the importance of knowledge and why knowledge builds our spirituality, and why we base it on knowledge, because we are a religion that believes our book is written by Allah or authored by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He is the one who wrote it, and He is the one who knows best. Who knows best what's best for us? And therefore, our goal, as Ibn Qayyim says and emphasizes, our goal is to understand what Allah wants from us, not what we want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because when we look for what Allah wants from us, it is based on the trust and belief that Allah tells us what's best for us. Right? And so we are achieving our, our, our goals our happiness, our wants, by applying what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us because that's the way we're going to get to it. Whereas if we start understanding the Qur'an from the, from the lens of what do I want from Allah, we will start twisting and turning these verses to fit what we desire. Remember the concept of hawa? You know, this uh, caprice as it's, uh, some people translate, you know, this desire. Well, that's very problematic and that changes religion and that changes people's understanding of religion it's the it's the one of the foundations one of the pillars of innovation and deviating from the straight path when we look at the quran when we analyze it when we study it our mindset must be what is allah telling me and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know blessed us with a book that is preserved but a book that can be studied in a methodological way it is an arabic book quran and arabiyya it is a Arabic Quran and therefore we understand it through the principles of the Arabic language and that has been preserved for us, for us. Right? how do we know that this word means what the scholars are saying I mean you try you're getting people who are challenging that now well how do we know that the scholar or the scholars weren't trying to control society right and therefore they they define this particular word to mean this in that you know as, a, as an attempt to control society now, what, what a lame uh, argument. But there is an answer to that. Well, you have this thing called pre-Islamic poetry that is preserved. And you can find these words in their poetry and how they used it. Right? So a book like, for example, Lisan al-Arab, um, which is maybe perhaps the most comprehensive uh, Arabic dictionary. What he does is he takes these words and... Um, backs up its meanings through Arabic poetry how it's used by the Arabs so okay the Arabs use this word you know pre-Islam too so they can't say oh after Islam there are certain conspiracies going on and, and attempts to control society and control women etc well you have it right there pre-Islamic poetry right um, so the Islam is a path and it is a, pa a straight path it is the only path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts and this is the path for those who seek a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran and Sunnah define this path they clarify it for us and they tell us how to stay on it because part of being on a path well you can fall off it and if you fall off it well it's, it can be hard to get back on it so how do you stay on it and if someone is off it how do you get back on it as we said it's about hope Right? We always are hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that um, He will take care of us regardless of how far away we have, may have you know, fallen. And did us sirat al mustaqim. So guide us on the straight path. Now we'll conclude with the following question. 
Um, we are making a du'a here. Guide us on the straight path. Um, now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered it once, why do we continue to repeat this du'a 17 times minimum a day? Right? So, because we can always stray and go off. So, if we are on the straight path, this, uh, this supplication is saying keep us on the straight path make us more enthusiastic about being on the straight path more knowledgeable about the straight path whereas someone who's off the straight path when they say it, they're asking oh Allah put me on the straight path so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the straight path uh,